In a previous video, I did uh, speak about uh, the brain as a quantum instrument, a com uh, quantum computer that uh, through quantum entanglement um, orchestrates language expression to communicate experience. And then I also said that uh, consciousness uses intention to modulate the entanglement of disparate parts of the brain to express language. You can check that video out before um, you, you follow this video if you wish. So uh, as I mentioned, I've been fascinated by language for as long as I can remember because uh, for one thing, I make a living selling words, but uh, the other is I look at uh, evolutionary um, evidence for the origins of language and how language uh, basically constructs experience, not only describes experience, but constructs experience. I feel that consciousness uses language to conceive, construct, govern, and become experience, become experience. So consciousness becomes experience through intention and uh, language. <clears throat> if you look at the evolutionary evidence for the origins of language, there is some timeline about its early development the capacity for language is believed to have emerged between 150,000 to 200,000 years ago, according to uh, biologists, evolutionary biologists. Uh, so that's uh, only 200,000 years max. And it is supposed to coincide with the appearance of anatomically modern humans in Africa. And of course, uh, you know, for language, to emerge, you need uh, coordination between the vocal cords, what's happening in the brain, the air in, in your lungs, in your larynx, in your vocal cords, your intentionality, and the computation, uh, quantum computation of the brain. So it's, it's uh, pretty complex and it requires coordination of multiple events all happening at the same time, even in evolution. The first speech sounds are estimated to have been uttered around 70,000 years ago, roughly coinciding with the migration of Homo sapiens out of Africa. Interestingly, the earliest speech sounds were likely clicks, click, 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 <laughs> which are still present in some African languages today. And then, of course, there are many theories. Proto-language, vocal track development, sound evolution, grammar, gram, gram, grammatical language, all coinciding or correlating or appearing simultaneously. And there are many theories. One is a continuity theory that says language evolved gradually. Then there's a discontinuity theory that says it happened suddenly uh, deriving from animal communication, and on and on, all the theories. But if language is a production of consciousness, which, by the way, everything is, and consciousness is without cause, spaceless, timeless, irreducible, fundamental, incomprehensible, inconceivable, but giving rise to everything, that ultimately becomes comprehensible, conceivable, and perceivable, then I think if we look at this infinite consciousness, cosmic consciousness, that has no beginning consciousness, no beginning, no ending, because it is beyond space and time, then that pure consciousness in Eastern wisdom traditions is the same thing as divinity. God is not, you know, a male-like or female-like figure 
although can be represented symbolically as archetypes, but whatever this incomprehensible divinity is, as Freeman Dyson said, God is what mind becomes when it passes the threshold of our comprehension, then language has a divine origin. Everything has a divine origin. In Vedic philosophy, um, language is considered divine as a mechanism for creation. Also in Christianity, first there was the word and the word was with God and the word became the flesh. The Vedic philosophy as encapsulated in ancient Indian scriptures provides a profound and mystical understanding of the origins and nature of language. This perspective is deeply intertwined with the metaphysical understanding of consciousness in Vedic texts. In Vedic texts, the term is vak, similar to the word, word, vak, word, vard, vak, word, okay, the word that becomes the flesh. In So vak is used to designate, denote language or speech, which is historically related to the concept of voice, vak, voice. The Vedic poet sages believed that their language was distinct from that of outsiders, and there was a significant difference between mundane language and the language used in uh, spiritual contexts. The language used in hymns directed towards the archetypes was revert, uh, referred to as Devi. Vak, Devi is the divine feminine. So Devi Vak means divine language. According to this understanding, language was created by the divine itself. This divine language is considered to be the ultimate form of communication, with three quarters of it being hidden from humans who have access only to a quarter of it. This suggests that the full essence of divine language is beyond human comprehension, can only be partially understood through mystical introspection. So language in Vedic philosophy is not merely a tool for communication, but is seen as an essential instrument for invoking the divine. The proper use of language in rituals was believed to have the power to secure um, divine intelligence and channel it. So this understanding is uh, very deep in the inherent power of religious language to influence the divine, or you might say channel divine intelligence with desired uh, outcomes. The Vedas, which are the most sacred texts of uh, India, are considered a purusha, meaning not of human origin. They're believed to be the eternal sounds that exists as the breath of Brahman. Brahman, see? Breath. Bro. Brahman. The ultimate reality. Brahman means to grow from the unmanifest to the manifest. So language, therefore, is eternal, uncreated, and existing beyond the limitations of human authorship. Now, of course, Sanskrit, the language in which the Vedas are composed, is often referred to as Deva, Devani, or the language of the gods, of the deities. This highlights its divine status and its role as the medium through which sacred knowledge is downloaded. The Mimamsa school of Vedic hermeneutics further distinguishes between Vak, which is speech, and Shabda, which is sound, the concept of Svota, representing the transcendent aspect of sound. Of course, you've all heard the word Om. In the Upanishads, the sacred syllable Om is given special significance. It is used in meditation and is believed to lead to the realization of Brahman, the source of all existence, the ultimate reality. Although Brahman is beyond all linguistic characterization, the use of Om serves 
Om serves as a bridge in the pre-final stages of spiritual philosophy. So in Vedic philosophy, divine language is distinguished from human language. It's believed to be created by the divine himself or itself or herself. It is actually herself. Saraswati is the goddess in a sense, both of language and culture and art and music. So it is considered eternal, uncreated, existing beyond human authorship. This language is seen as the ultimate form of communication with its essence being largely hidden from human comprehension. The Vedic poet sages claimed that divine language entered their hearts and was downloaded from Brahman. This suggests that divine language is not learned in the conventional sense, but is revealed to the sages through spiritual insight. So, why is this useful? Language is sacred. Our words can wound, our words can heal. Our words can take us to the source of all experience. So indeed, when you look at all the scriptures of the world, whether it's uh, whether it's the Quran or of course the Upanishads and the Vedas, and Vedas have you know different disciplines, Vedic architecture, called the Patya Veda, Vedic music, called Gandharva Veda, Vedic medicine, Ayurveda. But when you read the origins, the original text, they're in poetry. And they have onomatopoeia, where the sound echoes the sense, which is also true of the um, of the Quran. You know, when you hear it, it has uh, onomatopoeia. The sounds sound echoes the sense. The Bible verses in the original, similar. Uh, of course, Vedanta. It's all all the disciplines, architecture, medicine. I'm just thinking reading Sushruta long time ago when I was in medical school, describing diabetes thousands of years ago. The great sage said, eating but always hungry, drinking but always thirsty. The poor patient watches his flesh melt away in a stream of sugary urine. That was in poetry, sound echoing the sense. Like the poetry of uh, Alfred Lord Tennyson, Dry clashed his harness in the icy caves and the bare black cliff clanged round him as he based his feet on juts of slippery crag that rang sharp smitten with the dint of armed heels. Even as you hear the words, the sound echoes the sense and the imagery unfolds in your consciousness. So my friends, uh, watch your words, use them to heal. In fact, right speech is one of the eight paths to enlightenment, according to the Buddha. This is the basic function of mantras. Okay, the sound not only echoes the sense, but is the archetype for the patterning of space-time events, all as a result of confluence of entangled activities, not only in biology and brain, but also in consciousness. Divine language. Share with me your feedback and connect with me on digitaldeepak.ai. And if you have this book, you'll be able to use the right prompts to, um, to elevate both the, your well-being and your spiritual intelligence because AI is a language tool that will enhance our awareness. Even though AI is not conscious, it can enhance our self-awareness because it's a language tool and all language is ultimately sacred. So profane language can definitely bring down our level of consciousness and squeeze us into a very mundane experience of reality. Take care, my friends, and thanks for indulging me.